session on uh, reconstruction of Ukraine and the future of Europe. And we will spend the next 75 minutes together um, uh, discussing this topic. Uh, uh, and we also, uh, this special, this session is also uh, co-hosted by Dice and Matteo. Uh, we'll say a couple of words uh, of that later. Uh, I, who will moderate this session, my name is Fredrik Lötqvist and I'm director of Stockholm School of, uh, Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies, uh, uh, based at the Swedish Institute for International Affairs, UI. Uh, and we have existed for uh, a little bit more than a year and a half now, and we are currently working very intensively uh, with the Swedish government on supporting them with policy recommendations for a new policy on Eastern Europe uh, um, in view of the Swedish presidency. And of course, this uh, includes uh, EU enlargement, uh, reconstruction of Ukraine, military, um, uh, other security support, uh, uh, holding Russia accountable, and the future of Eastern Partnership. So this comes very, very timely, and of course, this is the topic of the day. Uh, we started this conference uh, with the topic on war in Europe, and that's where we are. This changes everything, and there's no, no going back. There is no status quo ante uh, before February 24th. We are out of the comfort zone. A new Europe is created, whether we like it or not, and we see history in the making in front of us. How we respond or not respond uh, to the Russia crisis that we're facing will not only shape the future of Russia, Ukraine and Eastern Europe for the coming generation, but it will shape the future of the EU, EU the Europe as a whole and the European project. Uh, uh, Russia's success or failure uh, will be decisive and you, Russia's failure is of course Ukraine being successful becoming a modern, sovereign uh, uh, country, a uh, modernized European country uh, in, in line with, with European uh, values, norms and standards. However, if Russia succeeds, if Russia's military aggression, unparalleled since the Second World War in Europe, bears any kind of fruit of aggression, if Moscow, the Kremlin, can draw the conclusion that military violence is a successful tool to achieve its political tools, well, then we will live in a totally different Europe. And that will be a lethal blow to the European security order and Europe as we know it. And a lot of these discussions we have here will become more theoretical about European reform and so forth. So very much is at stake. Uh, our support to that end, be it macrofinancial assistance, humanitarian support, uh, military support, reconstruction, will cost money. And this comes at a time when we are facing an economic recession, high inflation rates uh, and high interest rates. So this can very much be perceived as a burden, a cost, an unnecessary and unwelcome cost. But I think, and I will make the argument, that this should be seen as an investment, an investment in the future of Europe. And also holding the possibility, the vision of a Europe whole free and at peace uh, um, at the end of the corridor or the tunnel. And we also have to ask ourselves, what are the opportunity costs? What are the alternatives for getting this right? What will be, will be the cost further down the road if we do not succeed with Ukraine? So, reconstruction of Ukraine um, uh, is uh, very, very and intimately uh, linked to the future of Europe. And to, to discuss this topic today, we have um, uh, our panel. Uh, which consists uh, of Nonna Michelidze, who is a senior fellow at uh, the Instituto Affari Internazionale in Rome. And then uh, Matteo, also from the senior fellow, also from the Instituto Affari Internazionale in Rome. Uh, um, Svetlana Cekonova, who is a leading expert, energy expert at the Rasumkov Center, currently based in Denmark. And uh, Torbjörn Becker, uh, who is the director of the Stockholm Institute for Transition Economies. We, um, the question, sort of guiding questions for this session is what the role of the EU in the reconstruction of Ukraine will be or should be, and also in relationship to other donors and key players. How is the reconstruction of Ukraine linked? What is the relationship between reconstruction and the EU approximation of Ukraine? Can one think, uh, have the one without the other? Uh, will there be reconstruction without the membership perspective or a sort of European perspective for Ukraine? Um, how 
can the necessary resources be mobilized? And how will this affect EU budget? And what does reconstructing Ukraine into a prospective EU member, what does it mean and what does it entail? And also, uh, a big question, what would an Ukrainian EU membership eventually mean for the future of EU? It will be a different Europe. Uh, not least important it is the energy uh, um, aspects of this. What does the reconstruction of Ukraine in the EU, ex EU approximation mean for energy, for energy markets, energy production and transmission, energy security, resilience and the integration of, of um, uh, uh, European energy, both for Ukraine itself but also for the Union as a whole. And this also, of course, includes the question of decoupling from, uh, from Russia. Um, and finally, what role does the concept of differentiation, how should we think in, in terms of, of differentiation, both of EU's external policies in relationship to the countries in the Eastern Partnership, but also in the internal policies mean for the approximation of the three uh, uh, association countries, um, Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia. Uh, the panelists will uh, um, make some introductory remarks trying to address some of these questions and then we will have a sort of moderated uh, discussion and then uh, we will open up for questions and comments uh, from the floor. But uh, Nona, we start here from, yeah. from left to right. Please thank go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the introductions. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Actually, I wanted uh, to start what Richard was saying in the previous panel, namely that over the years there have been um, many criticism and a lot of negative literature uh, with the assessment, negative assessments on EU's democracy support in, in the new neighborhood. But we have also the success story and uh, I think that the, the story of Ukrainian resistance and the story of uh, the resilience of the Ukraine uh, society just proves uh, the success of the e European neighborhood policy of the European democracy support in, in the region because when uh, the Ukraine was uh, granted with the EU uh, candidate stature, status many thought that it was kind of the emotional reaction of the uh, EU to, towards uh, what was uh, happening actually I think it is uh, it was uh, a decision based uh, on the assumption that uh, Ukraine is not a failed state, even if there were some grounds to think uh, so, uh, that it has done a serious homework during the uh, eight, hours, eight years and since uh, especially uh, 2014 when uh, Ukraine signed association agreements uh, with the EU. Uh, several of these things helps Ukraine now to resist uh, the brutal uh, aggression of, of Russians. So what has been done uh, so far? Uh, one of the most important thing, I think it was the kind of fiscal restraint and moving over 10% uh, of uh, GDP budget deficit to 2% uh, redirecting to di uh, different uh, sectors. 5%, uh, for example, went to the military budget and this made possible uh, for Ukraine to survive, uh, especially the first two months before receiving um, the Western help and Western um, weapons in order to resist to the invasion. Uh, the second most important was uh, issue was the fiscal uh, uh, decentralization, the money going from central ba budget to the local communities, which contributed to strengthen local resilience. And now we, we see these brave mayors uh, in, uh, in different regions of Ukraine resisting uh, the invasion. This is thanks to the reforms which were included into the association uh, agreement. Uh, another was service reform was about the sovereign debt, about the banking sector, and then uh, we have all the measures uh, implemented in direction to um, uh, better the transparency and efficiency uh, of the political uh, systems. Uh, there were things like uh, Presura, which is a procurement system, uh, e-budgeting, which gave the possibility to the civil society representatives to have a look how the government was uh, uh, doing budget and what, uh, how the money was uh, uh, spent.
expand to uh, different provisions. And then uh, recently there has been this GIA, uh, GIA uh, in a application uh, which um, provides uh, civil services to uh, to the citizens in order not to make the uh, lines and to get all the services uh, online. And if we uh, think about all these uh, uh, measures, then uh, we understand that they um, entail in, them, in themselves also kind of anti-corruption mechanisms. No? All the decentralization issues that the uh, local authorities uh, have no more to look at the center um, uh, and to pay some bribes in order to um, uh, get money or, or the local citizens to get some services. Uh, um, these all are uh, kind of steps further into uh, successful anti-corruption uh, measures. Of course, there are a number of challenges. Uh, there is judiciary reform to be done. There is other anti-corruption uh, reforms to be implemented, but we have also to mind that judicial reform, it's not about the technicality. It's a political reform. I mean, there's, uh, because changing judicial system, this means that you are changing power structure uh, in the uh, society, in the country, and it will uh, take time. I'm speaking about the reforms because when we think about the reconstruction of Ukraine, we think to reconstruct also its, its uh, uh, governance. Uh, um, as said, up until now, international community provided uh, substantial, enormous military, financial and humanitarian uh, support uh, to Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine has to win the war, but it has to win the peace after the uh, war. Uh, and if Ukraine manages to do both, then it will often enormous geopolitical importance also uh, for, uh, for the uh, EU. But before to come to reconstruction, we have to help Ukrainian economy to keep going on and with the foreseen uh, 30% uh, GDP uh, constraint, uh, Ukraine uh, needs at least 5 billion per month, uh, which for now is provided by the US and uh, the, uh, the EU. Uh, and speaking about the reforms, despite uh, the war, the reforms have to be uh, implemented because then it will would be kind of the confidence building measure also between Ukraine and the private sector who should be one of the leading actors in post-war uh, reconstruction. But there uh, is a need also another guarantees, not just from Ukraine, but from international community for private sector in order to feel themselves motivated to invest uh, in Ukraine, um, uh, maybe from World Bank or, or from some G7 uh, countries. Uh, but uh, private sector themselves should see uh, this action not just an assistance to post-war country, but as an opportunity also for their businesses, uh, because uh, Ukraine is a country of enormous economical uh, importance uh, and uh, with uh, well-qualified, highly skilled um, uh, people, young generations, uh, and there have already been uh, serious uh, international companies uh, operating in Ukraine, like Google, for example, investing a lot in digital space because of this well-skilled young generation uh, in this uh, space. Uh, beyond private actors, there are talks about um, whether we can use uh, Russian money in order to rebuild Ukraine. Uh, the West has freezed uh, Russian assets. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen three days ago, she announced that uh, you want to establish kind of platform uh, and to study how to um, uh, confiscate and to transfer uh, this money to, to Ukraine. Please don't ask the question how because I don't know because there are a number of legal restrictions uh, and there are also a number of political and financial restrictions or interest because also in the US there are a lot of talks about uh, confiscating uh, 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 Russian central bank uh, uh, reserves uh, which uh, has been freezed by, by the US uh, um, but Federal Reserve already said that uh, uh, if we con uh, confiscate 
these reserves and transfer this Ukraine, this will be kind of negative signal to China uh, because China is enormously investing in, in dollars and such a signal then would maybe cause China decreasing its uh, in investment and this in turn can hit uh, the dollar. So all the challenges uh, regarding this um, we have ahead and we have to think um, uh, about the mechanism uh, how, to, how to face it. Uh, what the last first I think every effort from the international community should be well uh, coordinated and that should be one single platform which manages uh, uh, all the reconstructing uh, plans and idea towards Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. Matteo, please. Uh, thank you, Frederick. Uh, I'm here today to represent uh, one essential component of the DICE process, process, uh, project uh, uh, that was led by my Institute, uh, Institute Affari Internazionali, on mapping on a scenario of future differentiated integration within the EU and across Europe. And I will try to answer uh, some of your questions, in particular the one on the role of differentiated integration and uh, the future of Ukraine and the future of Europe, uh, in light of our results. Uh, and uh, that, by the way, we will publish in a policy paper next week, uh, so uh, <laughs> uh, the final result of this part of work uh, of DICE. Just uh, a two brief comment on, uh, on the paper and on the work done uh, within DICE. Um, this uh, uh, work on a scenario of differentiated integration was uh, basically uh, structured along, along three phases. First, we have uh, uh, constructed a methodology to classify different studies that in this year have emerged on a scenario of uh, differentiated integration that uh, ARENA did a tremendous work to put together and you can find all of them together in our website on uh, differentiated gate uh, uh, on DICE website. Second, uh, we have tried to conduct an actual mapping of the projection of differentiated integration within these studies uh, against main fault uh, in the policy sector within the European Union, but also in, a, the, in a relation with different forms of integration and differentiation, internal and external. So quite a relevant topic in relation with the challenges of today with Ukraine and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, further demand on the future of Europe. Lastly, in the last uh, phase of this, uh, of this uh, DICE project, uh, in, in this part of the DICE process, we uh, try to test this outcome with policymakers uh, and stakeholders in Brussels through a DICE uh, scenario marathon that was held uh, in October. And uh, the main results now we are, we are further developing in this uh, uh, policy paper that, of course, uh, deal with internal and external part of differentiation. So, what about differentiated integration and Ukraine? That is the topic of our today conversation. I will just make three uh, uh, brief points coming out from our study and our work on, on these uh, issues. First, it is clear that uh, the war and the ensuing of uh, candidate uh, status to Ukraine and, uh, and Moldova have uh, represented a dramatic turning point of, uh, of European history and also of academic debate on differentiated integration, including expectation of scholars on differentiation. Uh, uh, this event, uh, I have clearly uh, reopen the, uh, and revitalize the enlargement policy, that seems completely dead, and uh, 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 trigger a strong de demand for de-differentiation uh, from all EU surroundings, so uh, 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 in new external dimension. Second, this is quite an interesting development, as uh, uh, we can observe an almost complete revolution of uh, academic discussion in relation with differentiation that uh, uh, emerged just uh, few, uh, since in the last few years, especially in, in, uh, in uh, reaction to the traumatic Brexit event. At that time, the main focus and the new wave of study on differentiated integration emerged trying to find uh, uh, ways to make cooperation and further external differentiation possible to accommodate your relations with third countries. Now that world uh, in somehow has gone. It does not exist. The world has uh, put us in front of different uh, 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 reality with, uh, with uh, which we, we should uh, uh, be confronted. And so, if we want this, all this oblige uh, both the EU and third country to be much less ambivalent, uh, 
I mean, there is no more space uh, for constructing ambiguities, mm -hmm. nor from the uh, uh, EU partners, they are or with the EU or against uh, it, but also from the EU itself, uh, that we have seen how, uh, I mean, uh, ineffective have been uh, EU policy uh, towards uh, its surrounding, especially when it use constructive, what was called, was called a constructive in ambiguity, being it with Turkey, being it with uh, Serbia and Kosovo, being it or with uh, Eastern neighborhood. And so this, I don't think that will be possible in the future. It will be much, much less space for this. L uh, third, uh, and my last point, if all this uh, holds true, the key question is today how to make uh, this new process working, because we know it will be long and difficult. And uh, now uh, we, we, are, we have a momentum for cohesion with the EU. We, have, we see the, the June uh, uh, European Council voting for giving a session uh, uh, um, uh, candidate status to, to Ukraine and, uh, and Moldova. But of course, it won't be easy to transform this in an actual process of the differentiation. So the formal session of this country into the European Union. And so the key challenge is how to make this uh, uh, process sustainable effective and legitimate and <laughs> maintaining these three characteristics for a long period of time and this is not very easy and but i think in that respect <laughs> all the work done in this year uh, uh, on differentiated uh, uh, external differentiation differentiated cooperation with third country could be useful because uh, not as a, a landing point to find alternative to full membership now i don't think it's possible but to find a way to make uh, and reform the enlargement process uh, in a way that it is more effective. Mm. And this will be, I think, the key. And I think in this sense also we have to read uh, the, uh, the debate on the European political community. Mm. But I will mm. stop here uh, because I think my f five minutes have finished. Right, thank you. Lots of food for thought. That, and as I sometimes only half jokingly say, there is also construct uh, destructive ambiguity. Yeah. And, and I think yeah, constructive absolutely. ambiguity often has been. Um, uh, uh, Svetlana, uh, think, and I think you would want to focus a little bit on, on the energy aspects, which is a very crucial one yes, that's for right. reconstruction. Thank you very much for this opportunity to, dis uh, to participate in this uh, a very topical dis uh, discussion, very important for my homeland. And I would like to emphasize that uh, reconstruction of Ukraine and also um, EU approximation will have benefits for both sides. And I would like to uh, focus on a few directions of how the future development will look like uh, in terms of cooperation between the EU and Ukraine. First of all, it is electricity markets, because as you know, uh, Ukraine has successfully be, uh, was a uh, Ukrainian energy system, uh, was successfully integrated with the European network of transmission system operators for electricity and so on. And uh, this gives the, a new player for the EU. Uh, and there have been also the uh, energy expert, electricity experts to the EU. And they were, ha they were just terminated recently in October, just because of the uh, um, severe shelling that the Russian Federation was, um, you know, causing uh, our uh, electricity <coughs> infrastructure. Um, but uh, there is a great potential in continuing the experts of electricity to the EU in the future, and um, the uh, uh, transmission system operator of Ukraine is trying hard uh, to enlarge, uh, to, to negotiate with the EU the in, uh, enlargement of the uh, volumes of uh, transportation of the electricity to the EU. There's also uh, revitalizing of the uh, renewables um, se uh, sector, which is also very important for Ukraine's, um, uh, you know, ambitions, uh, the green ambitions of Ukraine. And despite the fact that 90% of uh, this sector has been uh, destroyed during the uh, war operations, there is still a great potential because this industry in Ukraine developed quite dramatically before the war. And uh, as of the mid of 2021, the uh, total capacity has reached nine uh, gigawatt, and that was 15% of the total energy balance of Ukraine. And also within uh, ten re recent uh, 10 years, 
uh, the volume of investment into this industry has exceeded uh, ten, uh, ten million billion uh, euros. Um, there's also uh, gas uh, gas market. Uh, reducing dependence on the imported gas. And this is um, true for European Union, and that's true for Ukraine. And since the beginning of war, uh, the natural gas uh, consumption has decreased by 40% in Ukraine, and the demand is being met uh, mainly by the uh, domestic production. So this is also an opportunity to uh, facilitate the domestic production and uh, 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 and, and do not rely on the uh, on the imports anymore, uh, because Ukraine is so rich of uh, uh, the gas deposits. But of course, a lot of the projects have been put on hold, unfortunately, because of the uh, uh, military operations on our territory. Uh, there is also hydrogen industry, which is uh, a very promising uh, sphere of cooperation between the EU and Ukraine. Unfortunately, this is a little bit a weak case for Ukraine, but um, uh, the research is underway to explore the uh, possibility of the low carbon hydrogen production, also uh, competitive price and supply routes. Uh, Ukraine has already been identified as a key partner of the European U uh, Clean um, Hydrogen Alliance and um, to participate in the future supply and hyd hydrogen uh, projects. Uh, there is also one more sphere, uh, which is combating the climate uh, change and reducing the gas uh, house. Um, um, yeah, <laughs> GHG uh, emissions. Um, you might know. Uh, you might have known that uh, Ukraine has presented its um, uh, second nationally determined contribution, aimed at reducing the greenhouse gas emissions by 65% by uh, th uh, 2030, as compared to 1990. And uh, actually, um, the uh, mm, ele uh, electricity uh, uh, mixture or electricity mix in Ukraine um, is mainly a low carbon because it mostly uh, depends on the nuclear production and also hydro uh, electricity and also uh, the renewables um, and the renew renewables. So um, the green energy transition was one of the strategic priorities of the EU and Ukraine before the war. And uh, uh, I should have to emphasize that uh, Russian invasion has made this approach even more urgent. Uh, Ukraine has announced its firm commitment to cooperate with the EU in line of the Green Deal goals as long as the military operations continue and there is uh, uh, destruction and, dis uh, and uh, the power grids um, are being destructed, uh, there is still an opportunity to move forward after the uh, military conflict is over. Um, of course, there is uh, a big destruction to our uh, energy infrastructure and uh, in order to uh, um, to make a vital plan for revitalization. Uh, technical audits are needed in order to evaluate the actual losses because, you, as you know, uh, there, there is a recovery plan for Ukraine that was laid out in Lugano and uh, it, was, uh, uh, it, like, it was like 700 and 750 billion. Uh, worth, which is, of course, uh, uh, including also the green transition, which was worth of 130 billion. Of course, it requires a uh, careful reviewing in order to uh, give an unbiased evaluation um, for our financial, for the financial, international financial institutions and also uh, the partners. So the recovery process would not be possible without participation of European partners providing unprecedented financial, military, humanitarian assistance to Ukraine, which has so far reached more than uh, 15 billion euros. And I will be, uh, uh, you know, 
pleased to answer the questions. And so the, I will just... Great, thank you, Svetlana. So, Torbjörn, we've heard a lot about sort of the requirements, mm -hmm. uh, the conditions, the wishes. So how do we go about this reconstruction of Ukraine? Yes, that's the at least uh, maybe $750 billion question, I guess, <laughs> uh, that we just heard. Um, but I think, to be a little bit more serious, reconstruction of Ukraine is going to be one of the most important uh, questions that we have to deal with in, in all sorts of um, science and policy spheres and, and business environments, etc., etc. So I think it's, uh, it's important that we start, of course, this discussion here today. Uh, at the same time, I think we always, when we do this, we have to remind ourselves that uh, the longer it takes for Ukraine to win this war, the costlier this reconstruction is going to be. It's a very trivial point, I know that, but it, it really means that we need to invest all the resources available here today to make Ukraine end this war sooner rather than later. So in terms of cost saving, win-win, call it whatever we want, you know, this should be number one priority as long as the war goes on. It really needs to stop, to just stop the damage and, you know, make us get a reasonable sort of final bill on what the reconstruction itself is going to be uh, costing uh, Ukraine, us and everyone else that want to contribute to this process. At the same time, I think it's really important that we have the discussion about reconstruction here today because we don't want to sit around and then one day the war is over. Let's say that someone in the Kremlin falls down a stair in February and someone else comes in and thinks this war is pretty stupid. We, we want the plan to be ready there and then to start the reconstruction in Ukraine. So, you know, we need to keep both of these ideas in our head together. Funding now to end the war, make a good, sound, solid plan for the reconstruction uh, that is ready uh, once we can see this uh, being uh, an opportunity. Uh, I've been, done, been doing quite a lot of, of the work uh, myself uh, in a group of economists that have, have pub published reports on the CPR platform. And we are now going to publish a book uh, developing the policy paper that's called The Blueprint for Reconstruction of Ukraine. It's now going to become a book that's going to be out there next week. And we provide a lot of details in terms of both, you know, the EU processes, the governance structures, how we can deal with corruption, how we can deal with the business climate. Uh, I think it's by now 16, 17 chapters detailing a lot of these different issues. So if you have the patience to read uh, a, a big book next week, uh, this may be one of the things to pick up. Um, but, but again, so if, if we go back to the question why how should we think about the plan? I think it's important to come back to the point that was already made. that We need a freestanding agency fully devoted to the reconstruction of Ukraine. This is going to be a long-term process. We do not want to mix it up with discussions in EU's other sort of bodies or at the World Bank or at the EBRD. Just like with the Marshall Plan after the Second World War, this needs to be a freestanding agency. It should, of course, have the Ukrainian government there putting forward their priorities of what should be reconstructed and how. And then the donor community should gather there together to make this plan in sync with the Ukrainian government. And of course, this also addresses an issue that always comes up when you talk about support Ukraine, which is unfortunately rule of law and corruption and, and the history that, that Ukraine has in this area. Uh, I think it's just very important that as, as a general guiding principle to remove opportunities for corruption in any country. And that, of course, also goes for reconstruction of Ukraine. So within this agency, there should be a lot of focus on making the plans 
but then of course checking that the plans that have been presented and funded are actually implemented. If we say that we're going to build 10 schools in, in a certain district in Kiev, of course we then go and find out that the 10 schools are there and used and functional you know, at the reasonable cost and all of these things. So, you know, add a layer of, of, of monitoring and following up and auditing instead of making, you know, I think the international donor community is a little bit known for having endless processes before you can start any project. Here we would argue that make this process ahead of projects a little bit shorter but focus a lot on, of your efforts on, on the monitoring and auditing and making sure that things were done uh, the way they were supposed to, to have been done. Um, I, I want to also maybe go back to a little bit uh, who is going to pay for the reconstruction. We, we have now seen that this discussion about uh, using the frozen Russian assets is there. And, and just for those not aware of the numbers here, we're talking about 320 billion or so of frozen Russian assets in the West. Uh, we can put this in context. So we, you have this massive 750 billion discussion at one end. We also have our colleagues at the Kyiv School of Economics that just look at the infrastructure damage. It's a much more narrow measure, but then we're talking about 130 billion. The World Bank says something in the order of 350 billion. So I, I just think we need to remind ourselves that if we can actually get these Russian assets, that would be a significant chunk to fund the reconstruction of Ukraine. So we should not just let people say it's impossible. I really think this should be sort of the go-to solution. Then we need to complement it with grants from donors. We cannot tell Ukraine, come here and borrow money, borrow money. The Ukrainian economy before this war was less than 200 billion US dollars GDP for one year. They already have debts on their books. We cannot tell them to get more debts on the books in the reconstruction process. It really needs to be Russian assets, donor grants, and then of course private sector investments because Ukraine has the potential to really become a growth market in the European Union. So this should be presented as an attractive case for investor once all of these reforms that we have been discussing here uh, have taken place. And I think, as we also heard, the, the energy sector would of course be a very natural uh, part to be part of sort of the green transition, not only for Ukraine, but for, for Europe as a whole. Uh, so that, that would be sort of the, the general uh, thinking of, of this. And I, I want to really stress what also Frederick was saying here, that we can talk about you know, the costs and the risks with sending all of this money to Ukraine, but we really need to understand what is the alternative of not sending this money, not taking these risks. It's something far, far worse. So uh, it's, if there was ever a cost-benefit calculation, that's pretty easy to understand. If there was ever a simple win-win case to be presented, you know, funding Ukraine, making it a prosperous uh, country that can enter the EU, that should really be uh, our first priority in, in all of these discussions right now. I'll stop there. Thank you. Th thank you. Um, there's a lot of things to chew on. I, I just like to pick up on, on the relationship between uh, reconstruction of Ukraine and, and uh, the EU enlargement and EU approximation. Uh, and it, it would seem to me that they are logically uh, very tightly sort of interlinked uh, because you're also what we're reconstructing Ukraine into is, is a prospective future EU member and also w with the EU norms and standards and, 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 and adopting the acquis. Um, and we've heard we need to mobilize these resources, Russian frozen assets or not. There needs to be a mobilization. There will need to be public funding, uh, grants, uh, loans, but also uh, non um, there will need to be private in, uh, investments, uh, 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 trade, uh, and so forth. So how are these, you know, all these funds going to be mobilized? And 
will anyone do this kind of investment in Ukraine if we don't see that Ukraine is on a path that has a European perspective? Uh, so is there a risk that we get caught here in a catch-22 where politicians in Europe will not be able to agree on, on, on EU enlargement and, and also not prepared to make the necessary adjustments on how EU does this to, to, uh, to allow Ukraine to do this? Uh, so, uh, or can we think of reconstruction without uh, a future Ukrainian EU membership? Just a quick, uh, if you have any quick, quick mm -hmm. reactions to this, any one of you. Um, yeah, Matteo. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, of, uh, it's very difficult to, to conceive <laughs> any possible path without uh, the enlargement policy. I mean, we have seen also uh, in this year, uh, for instance, to, to take a, a, a different example with the Western Balkans. Uh, I mean, despite all the uh, problem we had in, uh, in in the supply side of integration for this country, we, we have seen how within the uh, I mean, really linked to the, to the challenge of interdependence. I mean, the policy coordination of uh, their national policy with EU uh, policy have increased massively in the last 10 years. And despite uh, integration didn't formally advance uh, with most countries of the region, mm. still the level of policy coordination incredibly uh, increased because we had to face common challenges. This was evident for the uh, for, f f for the six Western Balkan countries. I'm sh if it will be even more evident with Ukraine that th there will simply not be enough resources. As and uh, uh, and uh, I mean and really the, the policy challenge that will be f f faced uh, will need a strong coordination. So an enlargement policy that is not only focused on the alignment of a key that of course is a, I mean has been a, the predominant part of your uh, 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 session so far, but also a lot of more policy coordination between what we do wi within the EU and what uh, the enlargement candidate uh, do, mm. even before a session. Mm. So a synchronization of uh, o o o a, a national coordination of, n uh, of, uh, of policy uh, through common resources. Mm. I think, uh, it, I mean, it, it's simply in inevitable because there is such a huge demand for that uh, that uh, we will find, uh, we have to work to find the best political condition to realize this uh, in the uh, less costly way. Mm. But... Uh, mm. Yeah, um, I think that when it comes to um, to the enlargement process, the EU still wants to stick to the regional approach, no? And we see that, and I'm not sure that this approach makes uh, any sense anymore because we see differentiated paths within the regions, uh, let alone within Eastern Partnership uh, countries and the decision uh, that was made uh, by the EU to grant Ukraine and Moldova with the candidate status and Georgia only with the European perspective, just as a demonstration that uh, the countries have different stories uh, in their way to implement uh, uh, the reform. As there is a different speed of implementation of the reforms. I think it's uh, their way towards the EU integration. It's not about the competition. So the EU approach should be really merit-based uh, in this case. And Ukraine should not wait to Georgia um, or M Moldova. The same is true, for example, when we make like the comparative analysis between uh, Moldova, Ukraine and some Western Balkan countries. No? For example, the association agreement signed by Ukraine and Moldova, it's a, a document about 1000 uh, pages. And uh, with the implementation of association agreements, especially if Ukraine succeeds to implement rule of law uh, and judiciary reform, uh, the EU will find itself uh, in front of reality where with the implementation of association agreements, these countries have satisfied 70% of the acquis. So in this case, then, it will find itself, the ball will be on the EU side and the question is that whether there will be a political willingness uh, to um, go beyond the technicalities and to decide really um, for more serious paths with which would be actual enlargement of the EU. Mm -hmm. Tobian? I, I just wanted to stress again this idea of we need to provide some upfront uh, financing. 
for basically Ukraine, of course, but I think in, in more general terms. The fact that countries join the EU at, at the significantly lower income level than the other countries that are already in the Union creates a lot of tension once they join uh, the EU. I know that's a bit harsh and, and it's about, you know, as an economist you have to be careful how much you want to stress economics, but I just think that, you know, it's in our own interest to have prosperous neighbors that enter the Union and not make them come in, you know, just at the lowest possible level. So this idea that you get much more funds once you're in the EU, I think, is very backward. Uh, it doesn't really make sense at all. So, you know, if, if there's a time to, to change how we think about what the financing available is for different types of countries, you want to spend the money uh, before countries enter. Of course, with all sorts of conditionality that, that we know about. But uh, I mean, so there are huge tasks ahead. Uh, we need to, to uh, find a way to go, uh, to, go um, uh, to move further the, the enlargement process and we need to mobilize funds. Are European leaders and European electors prepared for this? Don't look at me, I'm a recipient <laughs> country. <laughs> <laughs> or, or will history, so to say, I mean, because history is moving whether we like it or not now. Uh, and and Ukro Ukraine or and the Russian-Ukrainian war is a sort of the, the locomotive of history. But, but uh, will, will we be dragged into this, uh, uh, Europe, uh, uh, by necessity? Or is there a way that European leaders can take leadership and, and proactively actually be in charge, in control of this historical development? Y you know, I can make only the Italian uh, example now. Uh, and we saw that um, ex-Premier Draghi was one insisting uh, initially to grant Ukraine with the uh, candidate status. And uh, if you look at the public opinion in Italy and all the political debates, we see that the population favors Ukraine's integration into the EU, but not in the, uh, in, in the NATO, mm -hmm. and sees it as an opportunity or instrument to resolve the conflict because mm -hmm. they have this naive uh, um, kind of idea of Russia that Russia opposes only the NATO while it's perfectly happy with the, uh, with the EU. But the EU is uh, really an instrument from, from them to bring peace uh, to, to Ukraine. So in that sense, I don't think that Italian public opinion will ever make problems uh, for, for the enlargement when it comes to Ukraine. And I think the same is true also for Western Balkans. Can I just make a reflection from here in Stockholm? But w our Minister for Development Cooperation just said that Ukraine is going to be sort of the top priority for, for Swedish development cooperation. So, I mean, that's one signal. We have von der Leyen saying that we should seriously think about seizing the Russian assets. We have, you know, the Nordic Baltics going to Kiev. I mean, I, that's a, some pretty good signals, I hope. Mm -hmm. Matteo? Um, I mean, I I if Ukraine uh, looked like Switzerland today, that we would have no problem in, uh, in accepting them. So they, th I think that the key issue it will be, to, uh, uh, and if uh, it will lo look like, uh, uh, and the other way around, if uh, yeah, it wouldn't need so much the enlargement process if <laughs> it yeah, looks yeah, yeah. as Switzerland. But if we have an effective, uh, this is why we need to have an effective enlargement process that is able really to somehow not only stabilize but also transform and make these uh, country converge and of course differentiated integration in the sense of for instance opening uh, uh, cohesion funds before uh, accession could be a key instrument to 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 allow this process of convergence even before full formal membership so somehow to better balance uh, the uh, the benefits and cost uh, of uh, integration process uh, because it will be long and we have seen how somehow now is all the benefits comes after you are you access and this just does not work so well for country that are not able to uh, to to have a fast track uh, to, to, to to into you as uh, some had in the past mm -hmm. Svetlana, i mean we are faced with multiple challenges in the energy field russians are doing the best to bomb 
destroy all of the, the infrastructure. Yes, in that's the right. And also, but mm. nevertheless. But, but we, but we yeah. also have <laughs> problems, and some of these are domestic in Europe, so to say, with, with uh, 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 I mean, not all of the high energy prices and the problems we have with, with energy are related to, I mean, there was an energy event uh, in, in, in Germany, and nuclear power has been shut down, and at the same time, we are, are wielding uh, wind power, and we should have a green transition and everything. Does this equation really, uh, uh, is it solvable? Can we square this circle? Uh, and you, you talked about a win-win, so to say, that there's a, a, a mutual benefit, but how long do we have to wait for the wins of that? Because right now, European uh, 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 consumers, the newspapers in, in Sweden, I think in many countries, are full of, of you know, high energy prices and how to deal with this. Uh, uh, an enormous amount of taxpayers' money now are, are, are spent on, on, on covering the, the higher uh, 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 energy prices at the same time we have a, a, an inflation. So. Yes. Right now, it uh, seems pretty dark, uh, so to say. Yeah, uh, the green transition has been challenged, and we we, we can see it. Uh, and also, but Europe, European Union, is trying uh, trying hard to uh, to put together um, certain measures in order to um, help consumers and also businesses, and also trying to put some price caps, which is uh, probably not very. Um, a usual thing for European Union, um, but um, and also some of the um, uh, some countries has also resort to, you know, uh, to reopening their coal mines and maybe just uh, reconsidering their um, policy of using the uh, nuclear power plants just in order to overcome this energy crisis. But I don't think that. This, um, you know, um, affects very much the uh, the green transition is um, irreversible in that way, in that sense. And also, Ukraine is has been also committed to the green transition, and it has been uh, doing um, a lot of, um, I mean, creating a lot of uh, internal uh, strategies and documents in order to go in line with the European Green Deal. And uh, I hope that. Uh, uh, the war, of course, it has been um, um, destroying the uh, electricity uh, or energy infrastructure, but at the same time, we have an opportunity to reshape our energy uh, make, uh, mix and also our energy infrastructure. Like uh, uh, the thermal generation has been um, affected very much, you know, that have they have been shelling our thermal power plants most of all, but uh, thermal generation uh, constitutes only 30% of the whole energy mix. So uh, thermal uh, generation will be co uh, constitu um, will be substituted by the renewables in the future, and we have a big potential for renewables. At the same time, uh, Ukraine is also um, has to do again the homework, um, trying to do its best to liberalize the uh, energy markets. Uh, it is electricity market and also the gas market because there's still um, a lot of um, uh, distortions and the between the segments of the markets, uh, energy markets in Ukraine. And I'm talking not only about price caps and also um, administrative regulation, but I'm also talking about the uh, uh, public obligation, uh, public service obligation, which still exists in both uh, electricity market and also gas market. And it, uh, uh, you know, um, do doesn't make, uh, of course, um, doesn't allow to make a progress in uh, reforms on the energy sector. So, but finally, uh, the green transition <laughs> will, um, will be performed anyway. Very short, we also need to. Yeah, I, I'm just going to say one very simple thing, which is conserving energy should be like priority number one. Mm -hmm. Before we start thinking about how we can add production, just conserve as much as possible. In Sweden, 25% reduction in the southern parts is what they talk about now. So. Good. It's high time to uh, uh, let the, the audience uh, put questions or comment comments. Uh, I think we have time for, for one or two rounds, and I think we will take uh, two or three questions in a row, and here we go. So the gentleman there, and please uh, 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 introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, my name is Jakob Schöval. I am the representative of the Swedish parliament in Brussels. I was 
thinking of picking up uh, on the question of enlargement and and uh, and the future uh, of Europe. Um, in September, uh, the German Chancellor Scholz made the case in a speech at the Charles University in Prague that if the EU, in a foreseeable future, will grow quite substantially, that needs to be coupled with uh, treaty reform. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to, yeah, basically hear your reflections on this idea. Is it realistic? It is. Is it is it needed? Um, and what would that sort of entail? And what what's the reasoning behind this? Thank you. Thank. We had a question, gentleman over there. Thank you, uh, Frank Schimmelfenig, ETH Zurich. Uh, I have one question for Matteo. Um, could you? Uh, tell us a little bit more about, uh, say, the, the results of this um, in this uh, differentiation um, c scenario marathon. And I mean, you've 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 spoke a lot about, uh, say, a more effective enlargement policy. But um, I'd be c curious to hear uh, what this scenario building has has actually presented in that respect. And I guess a question for the others. I mean, are there any projections? Uh, on what the massive out-migration uh, mm -hmm. uh, out of uh, Ukraine means for uh, the prospects of reconstruction, especially now mm -hmm. as, as uh, the war continues. Um, are there any, uh, say, projections about brain drain and other, other mm -hmm. issues that might have an, have an impact? Very good. And we had a third question there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Eric Jones. I'm director of the Robert Schumann Center at the European University Institute. First, I want to say this is an awesome panel. So thank you guys so much for all of that. Um, I, have, I have two very specific questions. Nana, you made a point about the achievement of the acquis communautaire under the association agreements. I was just at, at DG Near, and I got a very different impression from mm -hmm. them about the level of convergence uh, in, in that particular aspect. So if you could explain that to me, that would be, that would be great. Um, and the second thing, um, my, my, I guess I have a, a, a deep concern. There's a, there's a deep skepticism in, in the European Commission right now about sustained derogations in the enlargement process. They don't want to bring member states in in, in the differentiated way, Matteo, that you, you were suggesting. Um, how do we overcome that? Because if we bring them in with sustained derogations, that also doesn't work. Look at Bulgaria and Romania. It makes me mm. very nervous. So, good questions. Appetite for treaty reform, anyone? Um, uh, the, uh, the role of migration, I think, is a very important one. And the, and, 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 and the brain drain. Um, and, um, ex you know, the, a the association agreement and the DCFTA, how, how well have they been impl implemented or not? And, Various views, uh, fantastic ideas on, 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 on differentiation and, and certain institutional resistance to, to, to this and some more specific questions. So maybe we just do a, a start with Don and, and work. Okay, the then I, down. I will last uh, with the very mm, last question. I didn't say that Ukraine has implemented association agreement. What I meant was that the provisions inside the association agreement repeats a lot of uh, conditions set by Yaki, and if Ukraine implements uh, association agreements fully, it turns out that it has already implemented 70% uh, of Yaki. Of course, now we are far away from that uh, goal. I want to just underline this, uh, the difference between association agreements that has been signed uh, uh, between the EU and the Balkan countries, because in terms of conditions and provisions are completely different and that, that ones that uh, the EU signed with Georgia, Ukraine and, and Moldova. Uh, on um, massive migration, so the, uh, there was like the first wave migration uh, since the war uh, started, um, but then we saw also the people going back uh, uh, to uh, to Ukraine. And then for, uh, since September, the things changed and it was linked to Russia announcing mobilization when Ukraine prohibited even the students to, to leave uh, uh, the country and ask those who are studying abroad to, 
to uh, back uh, home in Ukraine. So um, I think it will be difficult to measure the level of uh, uh, brain uh, outflow of um, of the country, but uh, still, uh, I'm, I th I hope that uh, this president that uh, when they saw that uh, Ukraine counteroffensive operations have been successful and this motivated them to uh, come back, then after the war. If Ukraine succeeds, I mean, they will go back to, to Ukraine. Matteo, differentiated reform treaty, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, treaty reform, of course, is fundamental, but maybe, I mean, there are also other means. Institu I would say uh, under the uh, broader chapter of institutional reform. I mean, we know there are pastoral clause and everything, but of course it will be fundamental, especially passing to qualified majority voting in some key in some key aspects, for instance, in foreign policy and, uh, and and so on. This will be would be extremely important, not only for the functioning of the EU, but also for make enlargement possible. Because, of course, the first counter-argument to enlargement is uh, look at uh, Hungary, look at uh, other countries. And, of course, if you have key policy deciding through uh, uh, majority voting, uh, qualified majority voting. Uh, also, I mean, problem in individual country would be n not so detrimental for the entire union as they are today. So this would easy also, I think, enlargement. Uh, and uh, of course, derogation uh, maybe it's a little bit linked with that. But uh, I mean, we have seen that they do not work. Uh, so this is one reason more why we should uh, do much more uh, before a session, uh, and we can do that. Uh, so, because we know that when a session is credible, it's a powerful uh, instrument, uh, right. and there we can ha uh, we can make uh, demands that uh, that uh, that works. And we see, I mean, uh, we have asked many many different things that maybe <laughs> to, to other larger countries that s they still somehow uh, um, were able somehow to trigger some uh, some 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 uh, s uh, some adaptation. Uh, the scenario marathon. Okay, I, I will not open <laughs> this. Uh, it's, it's too long to describe what uh, we all uh, we have done. We have basically tried to 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 use uh, the work done by Arena on uh, on on collecting through uh, the, this, uh, the recent year work on defensive integration, especially under the category on the future of Europe. And we start to somehow classify and to organize in a little data set uh, projection uh, between uh, f uh, the, the next uh, five, ten years uh, uh, that were present in, in different studies, not necessary uh, on a scenario, but uh, a different study on differentiated integration and, uh, and expectation the, in the next. Uh, and then we use this mapping to 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 make this exercise in Brussels, uh, uh, and we we focus on the extreme uh, of positive uh, scenario where integration proceed uh, and uh, and uh, the most negative scenario. And we work with policymakers try to understand uh, w w w w uh, so, uh, which are the key factor that could uh, lead to that situation. Situation. So it's not really about predicting the future, but it's more about uh, broadening a bit uh, our expectation to, to to get ready to make today policy choice that uh, could be a bit more effective. Mm -hmm. And we need we need some political fantasy and yes. imagination. Svetlana, are there anything? Any of the questions you want to pick up on? Um, well, this is not a, a uh, my research <laughs> area, but. Uh, uh, my colleagues from uh, the think tank in Ukraine were also giving some recommendations uh, how to uh, to help Ukraine in this uh, very difficult pro process, especially when uh, there is a seven million people uh, fled the country and uh, trying to, um, you know, um, I don't know, maybe going through very hard times there because there's no opportunity to settle down and also to have... Uh, um, you know, plans for the future, but they also think that uh, um, the funds that they were um, actually um, d devoted to the uh, refugees abroad could be just um, maybe given to the uh, uh, people temporarily displaced uh, um, inside the country in order to help them uh, to find a job and to just to feel themselves more comfortable, if that's possible, under the uh, current circumstances. And also try to think about um, uh, the temporary jobs for a lot of people who would like to participate in the reconstruction. 
there is right now there is a lot of uh, uh, infrastructure uh, facilities that needs to be uh, renovated so before we think about very global things we have to get rid of all these um, ruins that we um, you know have been experiencing the recently so there will be also a good chance to to help um, with the fi financing this temp temporary uh, reconstruction work. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to say the obvious thing that it's kind of a chicken and egg problem, the migration and reconstruction. Uh, of course, the seven million people are needed in the reconstruction, but they actually need to have something to return back home to. Well, so obviously we, okay. we need to provide at least some minimum basic level of housing. We need to make sure there are employment opportunities, school for the kids, you know, pretty simple things, but. I, I mean, that has also been a, a topic of the discussions on enlargement that one uh, before the, the actual accession that you, you uh, Ukraine, a country like Ukraine could be integrated into the single market and the four freedoms and so forth. But then the question is, how wisely would it be to actually have the, you know, the free movement of, 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 of labor if that's, uh, uh, if, if that's a, a good place to, to start or not? We are slowly moving towards the end of this panel, but I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. And I see we start with the lady there, down there, baby. Thank you very much. My name is Simon Bunze and I'm the content manager of the Stockholm Forum on Peace and Development and it's based at Cipri. Um, I just have a very short question. Um, how easy or difficult from a legal and political standpoint is it to use the frozen Russian assets? Mm. To, to use the frozen, frozen Russian assets. assets. <gasps> Thank you. The gentleman uh, down there. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yep. No. Which one? The behind, behind, yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Jory de Brouwer from the Egmont Institute in Brussels. I would like to follow up briefly on the issue of enlargement. Uh, I mean, uh, Matteo, I, I heard what you said. Okay, we all know that the outcome of the Conference on the Future of Europe will be presented tomorrow. Uh, that uh, the parliament is advocating for minor treaty changes and that the member states are just dead against this idea. And this we even without referring to enlargement. So, okay, uh, Jim Gloss is not in this room, but I mean, he always used the same example to show that uh, treaty changes will be needed if we want to process enlargement the good old ways. Can we think one second that in the future there would be seven Western Balkan commissioner and just one German one, as an example? So of course treaty changes will be needed, but nobody is ready to engage in that treaty changes. So that leads me to maybe think about an alternative scenario, building upon what uh, you said, uh, Mr. Mr. Becker, if I re read your name correctly. I mean. Let us assume that indeed Ukraine and others are fully implementing their association agreement and we know that there are different levels of ambition. So they would be close to fully member of the internal market. If we add to that, I mean, massive injection of money before or just as they are, we end up in a situation which was close to the good old Romano Prodi, everything but institutions. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the future of the EU architecture? All the more, and there is an elephant in the room that never, n n nobody ever refers to when talking about enlargement. What about Turkey? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is still a candidate country to my knowledge. So why do we disconnect Turkey from Georgia, uh, from, so, sorry, Ukraine, Moldova, or the Western Balkans? They are still in the waiting room and they have been there for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. I think we have to draw uh, a line for the questions here and I will and then we will have a final round and I will add another question. Uh, uh, the Swedish presidency will be done for the next six months. Uh, it, this is at the critical uh, juncture in, in, in history and of course no one knows how the, the, the situation on, on, on the ground and the war will develop. And of course the Swedish presidency has a very limited role uh, on in, in this but if you could have one single wish of a political decision from the EU within the coming six months, what would that top wish be? So uh, we had the questions on the frozen assets and, and, and treaty change, and then my question on, on your wish. If you could write a list to Santa Claus or the Swedish presidency or von der Leyen or, or Michel or whoever, what would be on top of that list for the next six months? Uh, maybe mm -hmm. we start from, from you, Torbjörn, this time and give Nona the last word. So. 
Okay, frozen assets, we need to ask the lawyers, I guess. I'm an economist, I don't know these things, so I'll skip that. Uh, my Santa wish list thing, number one priority, create a specialized agency for the reconstruction of Ukraine. It should start working already now to, to coordinate the support that is needed before the war ends, but it should be there ready to move once the war is over. Svetlana. The Swedish presidency and close coordination with the high representative should maintain and develop EU support for Ukraine's defense capabilities in order to ensure Ukraine's victory and to minimize human suffering and economic destruction. And this is from also um, the just a common, um, you know, um, um, wish of my colleagues also. Right. From yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alternative to reforms, I have this one. Uh, uh, I think uh, I think there are no alternatives to reform also within the European Union. I mean, it's overdue. It was should have been done probably a <laughs> year before. And it's not something that we have to do because of enlargement, but it's necessary for the functioning of the European Union. And the alternative, I'm not saying that is easy or that is probable, but prob <laughs> yeah, probably is not the most probable outcome. But then also, I mean, and probably uh, also enlargement is not the most probable, but, uh, uh, but there are concrete risks of, uh, mm -hmm. and we have seen what has happened with Turkey, with, with the Western Balkans, of have uh, a never ending enlargement process that uh, uh, little by little lose effectiveness uh, and we. Uh, and we uh, 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 we waste a huge amount of power that we have um, of uh, a much a lot of demands. We, we have the large voice like a genius uh, uh, from the bottle. You have three desires that you can ask to the candidate straight. When they are gone, they are gone, mm. and we don't. We, we really cannot uh, uh, misuse them in this uh, in this moment. I think. And uh, yes, and uh, the Swedish uh, presidents. I think uh, what uh, uh, did uh, the. Uh, 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 the, um, the presidency of Czech Republic, uh, 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 they conveyed the first EPC meeting. Right. Mm -hmm. I think something should be done uh, on how to better connect that new format uh, with European institution. Right. I think this would be the key and to have some really concrete answer. Also how to better connect it with the needs uh, of uh, enlargement policy. Mm -hmm. Nona? Uh, so well about the wish list. Uh, Beyond the wish list, I heard that today uh, Anna Grant Crump Karnbauer, <laughs> it's difficult to pronounce, um, which was the ex the defense minister of Germany, now she is a state minister for EU relations, if I'm not mistaken, has said that the EU will start accession mm, negotiations with the Ukraine very soon. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, we have discussed a lot of big questions uh, uh, um, uh, for the fate and future of Europe. Uh, I think uh, we uh, there were expert uh, 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 political pundits that tried to solve uh, the problems of Eastern Europe for the ten twenty last years. So have experimented with all these ideas of grey zones, countries in between. Uh, buffered zones or whatever, and I think we have seen that we have to come to an end to that. And and the the the, the ambiguity was not creative, but but uh, destructive. And Europe has now to move uh, forward. Um, uh, and uh, and maybe uh, Matteo, maybe the EU is a little bit what Churchill um, said about the Americans once that uh, once we've exhausted all other possibilities, we will do the right thing, so to say. And, and uh, uh, maybe historically that what's happened. And I also want to extend a warm thank for all of those who have watched this um, uh, online. And thank you very much for coming here. And let's give our, our speakers a warm round of applause.